Hi everybody, hi, I'm Dina Asher-Smith and I am motivated by a fear of failure. Okay, motivated probably isn't a strong enough word to express how I feel, it's more like an allergy to me. An itching, nagging feeling deep inside me that gives me an inability to be complacent with anything. It's the feeling that had me waking up in the middle of the night just so I didn't fail my degree this summer and I'm sure you all kind of know how that felt. And also it's kind of what had me defying all odds in representing my country and meddling in the World Championships this summer in London, just five months after breaking my foot. Now, so often in the world of sport, we're asked, what motivates you? A hunger for success or a fear of failure? And if you kind of stick your hand up for the second one, you get those side eyes and people look at you like, hmm, you're motivated by the wrong thing, honey. But, <laughs> but um, and they always assume that if you fear failure, you don't have the courage to set high dreams. You don't have the courage to chase your dreams. That a fear of failure comes burdened with the, in with the inhibitory factor that in it, inhib it inhibits courage, tenacity, and growth. But of course, I'd like to counter that. Loathing failure does not always come with the debilitating element of not embarking on your dreams. And in fact, I'd like to argue that a healthy fear of failure never does. Understanding that failure is, of course, inevitable in life. And of course, it's essential for growth and also setting those high and seemingly unattainable dreams has the power to motivate you to achieve things that people didn't think were possible. And in my case, when the odds were stacked way against you. So I'd like to take you back to when I was eight years old and I decided to become an Olympian. I remember watching Kelly Holmes in the Athens Olympics win a double gold and I was like, right, that is absolutely incredible. But in the true spirit of an eight year old, that wasn't what made me want to be an Olympian. It was the fact that kind of when she got on the podium, they gave her what I thought was a crown. But of course, <laughs> we all know now, now I know. Um, it was obviously paying homage to the ancient Greek tradition of like the wreath. But as an eight year old, I was like, look, that's what I want to do, mum. On the podium, she's got a crown. She is a princess of Olympic proportion. That is what I want to do. And you can probably imagine my dismay four years later when I watched the Beijing Olympics, four years into trying to become an Olympian in something and um, they didn't have crowns. I was like, what's going on, mum? She was like, that's because it was in Athens. And I was like, oh yeah, of course, thinking, oh, well, I've, I've tried for four years now. I might as well just stick with it. <laughs> but, um, at that point, I was kind of this child that I loved sport. I kind of just tried everything. I was complacent, well, not the same complacent, but I was happy with just improving every single day. I wasn't necessarily, I wasn't necessarily always the fastest in my training group, the fastest in my county, the country, and certainly not the world, but I was just happy with improving. As a child, that's just what I wanted to do. I, was a, I used to swim, I used to do diving, and of course, I used to do athletics. And kind of coming up to 2012, I, be, I was a junior international and I got the opportunity to kick Harry at the London Olympics, which was, of course, an unforgettable experience. And I remember first when we got handed our duty sheets, I was disappointed that I missed the Sunday where it would be the men's 100 metre final because obviously I wanted to see Usain Bolt. And I got the Saturday the, the day before. And I remember thinking, oh, man. I want to see Usain Bolt once in a lifetime experience, but I got given the Saturday. Why did they make my life like this? But it turned out to be Super Saturday, of course, with Greg, Jess and Moog achieving the absolute unbelievable and getting three gold medals for Great Britain in the space of maybe, I, I don't know, the, I should probably know the exact timings, but in that session. <laughs> And what really resonated with me was, yes, these people had achieved their dreams. They hadn't failed in what they were trying to do. But what was more apparent was that when I looked around, I saw that people that didn't know them, they didn't know maybe everything about them. They were crying. They were genuinely so proud of them. They might not know that time, like for months at a time, Mo has to leave his family and go and train at altitude to make sure he can perform to the best of his ability. They didn't necessarily understand that Jess Ennis didn't go to the Beijing Olympics because she broke her foot very, very close to the actual game. So she missed out on it and London was her first Olympics. They didn't know that. They didn't see them wake up at 5 a.m. to go to, to training. They didn't see all the times they didn't hit their goals. They were crying and they weren't the shoulders to cry on. But these people, they were touched by their achievements. And that for me resonated. I thought, how incredible is it that you've been given a talent or you've worked so hard to cultivate this talent. And by just not failing at your expectations, not failing at your goals, you can kind of 
light up these people's lives. I mean, remember when you go around talking about where everybody knew where they were on Super Saturday. They thought that was absolutely incredible and that's what inspired me. And that's what motivated me to really take my athletics to the next level. And I knew at that point that in 2017, five years after London 2012, there was going to be another opportunity for athletes to, from Great Britain to compete in front of a home crowd at the World Athletics Championships. And obviously I, I was Kit Karen at the Olympics, that, that shift had sailed for me. But for athletes, a world championships in your hometown is the closest thing you're ever going to get to a home Olympic. So I told myself, right, that night in London 2012, I was like, right, next time there becomes an opportunity for a championships in London, I have to be there. And that motivation took me from being a girl that was very happy to make junior teams, just about scraping in in the second wave of selection to becoming the year after European junior champion, the world's youngest relay medalist, then world junior champion, then British record holder over 100 and 200 meters, and then somehow becoming the world's fastest teenager ever over 200 meters. So you can imagine the, expect, the personal expectation and the public expectation growing. My, me, myself, I was getting excited for my career prospects. I was getting excited at the prospect of what became looking highly likely and obviously did become like me becoming an Olympian, going to Rio and getting a bronze medal with the relay team, which is obviously so special, but also looking to kind of do my country proud in front of the whole nation in London 2017. So you can imagine, I've been dreaming, and this has been my motivation day in, day out throughout my training sessions for four to five years. And then five months beforehand, in the lapse of concentration, I fractured my foot. I hit my foot on the underside of a bench when I was doing a plyometric jump, and I fractured my navicular, clean, straight in half. Obviously, I would require surgery, and I'm sure at the Royal Society of Science, you guys know that if you especially as a sprinter, a power sport, any foot in your foot, any bone in your foot that you don't want to break, it's the navicular. And I was faced with probably having a year out. Certainly, I was told, certainly not making the athletics championships. Highly unlikely, they said, you're gonna make the athletics championships. And just failure, that was what was going through my mind at that point, failure. I had this dream for four to five years. And suddenly, in a lapse of concentration, everything that I'd worked for, everything that I kind of dreamt about was just taken away. And they said, maybe you might be able to physically run. You might have like the strength to run by the time August comes in five months, but you definitely won't be in any shape to sprint. Never mind being world class, never mind being able to represent Great Britain or compete with the best in the world. And when they say that failure, I remember people just being like, I just remember thinking failure, failure. I've been dreaming this. I've been thinking about it. It's been my motivation. How can I not go? I just didn't understand the fact that I wasn't going to be there. Not because I was silly, I didn't understand the situation I was in. I very much understood what was going on with my foot, but I wasn't gonna let anybody kind of tell me what was gonna happen in five months time, in five months time, when I'd been dreaming about something for five years. I was not going to allow myself to fail. I promised to myself that I was going to exhaust all possibility. I was going to work as hard as I could to not fail at something that I'd set. And if I did still fail, because obviously failure is, inev is inevitable sometimes, then I could hand on heart just say, look, it was a big ask, but at least I tried. But so because I was trying, from then on, I was crazy to so many people. Here was I, a 21-year-old woman, kind of going against what everybody was telling me and deciding valiantly that I was going to be in the World Athletics Championships. At that point, I was so grateful to have well, obviously my friends and my family, but for incredibly intelligent and bright and talented people, my coach, my, well, my track coach, my strength and conditioning coach, and my two physios who probably were the only people when I was still in crutches, still hazy from the anaesthetic, also trying to write my dissertation because that was just a hectic time of year. And <laughs> yeah, I know, it was not it was no fun. And I said, by the way, I'm going to be in London, I'm gonna want a medal. And they didn't try and dissuade me. They didn't try and tell me, what are you thinking? They just looked at me and they said, Dina, you love to make our lives difficult, but okay. And training for the World Athletics Championships alongside trying to complete a history degree at King's, it was mentally and physically exhausting. There was times when I take my kind of physical ability for granted, you know, when you just jump over puddles, you run for a bus and you don't think about it, to the time when I had to, walking was a challenge. I had to retrain myself to walk, to jog, to sprint. And I had to tell myself how to hop around in a circle again, which sounds so ridiculous, but my brain and my calf and my foot just weren't connecting. And 10 weeks before the World Athletics Championships, I sprinted for the first time, just 10 weeks. And I was so unbelievably happy. Eight weeks before the Athletics Championships, I put on spikes, which is obviously essential to any sprinter. And, um, and that was two weeks before the trials. 
And I remember going into the trials and I ran, it was in lots of pain, I definitely wasn't fit. I ran half a second down on what I would normally run, which is obviously huge in athletics terms, but it was a start. I wasn't running quickly, but it was a start. The condition for me to go to London is I had to show some sort of form. So by running after a fractured navicular in surgery, hey, I showed form. So, <laughs> so the selectors have faith in me and they selected me for the athletics championships. And then focus from then on was not just being healthy, was not just running painlessly, but it was being world-class. It was being as close to my best as possible. So many people have told me, oh my God, it's so good that you're running. You've been so positive, it's great. But um, I wasn't in the business of just being positive. I don't go into championships to just make up the numbers. If I'm there, I want to be the best that I can be. And London was no different. So I remember training and doing the most horribly disgusting training sessions in the weeks leading up to London. Normally, with, when I'd had the luxury of 10 to 11 months to train, I'd be kind of chilling out, doing a few more blocks, running 10 meters now and again. But no, I was running 250s, 150s, 160s with 45 seconds recovery. It was gross. But yeah, it was. My coach probably see this and be like, mm, but it was gross, John. <laughs> but um, I remember when I walked into the stadium that day when it was my heat, I was just wholeheartedly grateful to be there. Obviously, I'm always grateful when I put on my vest, but after knowing that it was so close to being taken away from me, I was so grateful. So then I went, but obviously I had to throw that out because you've got a job to do. <laughs> I went and won my heat. I qualified for the final. And at that point, I had surpassed my own personal expectations because, well, of course I want to go there and medal, but realistically, being there making the final was absolutely amazing. And then somehow just using the crowd and just really digging deep inside me and swearing to myself that I'm going to go for this. I managed to run half a second faster than I had all year, faster than I ran the Rio Olympics. I know, it's crazy. But, <laughs> and I came fourth by eight hundredths of a second. I was so close to getting a medal individually. Obviously, we went on to win a silver medal in the relay, which was absolutely incredible. But individually, I was so close. And I think I was within 15 hundredths of winning the entire championships. Obviously, there's three other girls there, so I'm not saying I, I would off, but you, you get what I mean. <laughs> and, well, that's quite rare. Considering the journey I went on five months earlier, I broke my foot, couldn't run before 10 weeks, and all the other girls have been training for 10 to 11 months. That was quite rare, and that's what I'd kind of like to leave you with. The fact is that my fear of failure, my deep-rooted fear of failure, gave me an inability to be complacent. I wouldn't settle for other people's limits, and I don't settle for other people's limits, because I'm sure all in this room, people have told you you can't do things, but then you go and prove them wrong. I love a challenge. We should all love challenges, and therefore we should, we should fear not being able to achieve the dreams that we want simply because it makes us work harder. It makes us efficient. It, makes, it made every single part of my rehabilitation done, was done perfectly. It was done to the timings that I needed because every single nail, oh, I'd take every single nail on the head <laughs> if I wanted to be in the best shape I could be in London. So I'd like to leave you with a final thought. Understand that of course failure is inevitable in life and of course it is essential for growth and you need it but also use a healthy fear of it to motivate you to achieve things that you didn't even think were possible. Don't settle for other people's limits simply because they don't know you, they don't know what you have inside you, they don't know kind of what drives you every day or why you're doing it but just make sure you, make, you go out there and give everything your all because everything becomes possible once it's done. So thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.